And now I have the exciting honor, honor to introduce to you our next speaker. It's taken nearly 80 years, but today, finally, we can say that there's a woman running the Federal Communications Commission. Well, go women, yes. While she is new in that role, she's not new to many of us. Mignon Clyburn has worked diligently during her tenure at the FCC to understand the issues that we face, to delve into how our businesses operate, and to grasp the impact on our industry and how that affects American citizens. She joined the FCC in 2009, and she's now serving her second term as a member of the commission. Last month, she ascended to her role as acting chairman of the commission with the departure of Julius Janikowski, while the nomination of Tom Wheeler remains pending in Congress. So please join me now in welcoming the acting chairwoman of the Federal Communications Commissioner, Commission, Mignon Clyburn, and to chat with her this morning, NCTA's president and CEO, Michael Powell. Thank you. This will be a lot easier than yesterday up here with this screen and everything, but um, I am so excited to sit here. Having once sat in your seat, I can't tell you the sense of personal pride at, at seeing you uh, come in behind us and achieve all that you've achieved. Uh, I've known uh, the chairwoman for a very long time. She, this is not the first time she's been a chairwoman. She was the chairwoman of the South Carolina PUC, and we were good friends back then, and so I'm very, very proud Most of you. Most days good friends. Most days good friends. <laughs> you know but, that federal state friction. Yeah, yeah, well, preemption. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, it's good to have you with Thank us. Thank you so much. And I want to congratulate you on two fronts. What a phenomenal conference, all because of you, I know. No, not hardly. But, uh, Thank honestly, you. Honestly, this is fabulous. But uh, you continue to surprise me. Um, you upstage MC Hammer yesterday, I heard? <laughs> I'm still working on my hammer crawl, but that'll right. be next year. So is this power time? No, Stop. this is this is Clyburn time, so <laughs> we'll get started. So mu much gets made, you know, having grown up in a family who, who knows what it means to have the burden of being first in something. Um, it's pretty obvious and compelling that you're an exemplar to, and I would say not just women, but to men, uh, because of your achievement. Um, we know what it means as, a, as, as breaking a barrier that has long existed. But what I'd like to ask you is, in those quiet moments when you're sort of by yourself, what, what does it mean to you personally? Not, not to society, not to other women, but to, to you. To me, I think often about my grandmother, who was always encouraging, who wasn't allowed to get much past the sixth grade because of the laws of the land in South Carolina but she always encouraged her children and grandchildren just to do the best that you can. And I think of her in those quiet moments because she embraced me. She knew while she could not help me with my homework, she literally helped me with every other facet of life. So when I sit in those moments you know, that are more rare, uh, I think about her. Uh, and I think about that kind face and that warm embrace. And I think about also more current, 57% of the women who are now make up the college uh, of roles. And I think that there is one more crack in that ceiling. And I am just so happy about that. Wow, that's terrific. That's terrific. We're very proud of you. Well, you have the benefit, the blessing or the curse, too. Uh, I've had several years of experience before ascending to your current position, uh, and that gives you a very strong foundation as you take the helm. And you, you know our industry, and, and you know uh, much of the direction that it's headed and the innovation that's present. Um, what are some of the things that, that, that excite you uh, about what we're doing, or, or really you think have an opportunity to make a deep and meaningful contribution to the country? As I walk through the halls, and I will get a, a fuller tour a little later, it's about the options. No matter where you are, 
you have the opportunity to engage, to devour literally that content. And that in and of itself is phenomenal to me. Uh, you know, we are more mobile uh, and uh, we rely more on our devices, you know, our tablets, you know, our smartphones and the like. And to know that this industry was a big driver in getting uh, those content providers to migrate to these platforms is wonderful. And so no matter what your price point, you know, what, what your personal budget is, there's an opportunity for you to engage in this space. And to me, that is the biggest win for you and for consumers. That's terrific. Um, you were in an awkward position at, at some level because you were, you were introduced as the acting chairwoman. Yes. Um, you should know me and uh, the chairwoman have this debate because there is no such thing as an acting <laughs> chairperson of the FCC. Uh, if the president designates you, you're it for yes. as ever long uh, as you're pleased to serve. So uh, there's nothing acting about you in my mind. Um, but as you take the helm, given that you know that you know in advance how long you, you may have roughly to serve, how do you think about setting an agenda and keeping the agency moving forward and maybe some of the things that you hope to achieve in the time that you have? Well, regardless of how much time uh, and, uh, that we have in terms of leading this agency, I commit to all that I remain duty focused. I have to run the agency. I will run the agency to the best of my ability. We've got nearly 1,800 wonderful people that are helping me uh, do that. And from your perspective, we are fulfilling our industry measurement requirements. Uh, you know, we released the uh, cable price survey uh, last week. Uh, before the end of the year, we will look at the video market, the competition in the video uh, market. Uh, of, of course, we've got that little thing that you might have heard about, incentive auctions. Mm. Um, so one of the things as it relates to congressional mandates uh, that we will fulfill is, is that gets most of, uh, it's taken up a lot of the oxygen right now in this space, but that is a good thing because it's a potential win-win for uh, mobile operators as well as broadcasters. So in the meeting in June, we will talk about that. We'll get a, a status update on that. The Video Accessibility Act, the communications, what we call CVAA, uh, we are, have not missed, and you would appreciate this, in almost three years, not one major deadline in terms of the implementation of that. And what does that mean? That means that nearly 54 million Americans each and every day have a better opportunity of engaging in this space, not just from t uh, television engagement, but all devices, you know, all platforms, and that is something that we should be proud of, and uh, we are working very hard to continue to close those gaps, those technology gaps, those digital divides uh, for all Americans, and I'm very proud to be in a position to, uh, to have a hand in that. Yeah, you know, I want to I take a second to, to commend you. I think there is a part of the chairman's job or chairwoman's job that's uh, not that visible to most and sometimes not as sexy to most, but you, you're, you're the CEO. Yes. And uh, you called me recently and we were talking and <laughs> you He's going to tell you, it. He's going to tell you it. You never told me about this part, <laughs> yes. um, running an agency of 1,800 people. But I, uh, I won't ask it as a question, but what was wonderful was that you were as dedicated and committed to trying to make sure that the men and women of the FCC were were led and were focused on, had the managerial resources necessary to do their job, and that's often the underappreciated challenge, and I know you're working hard on that too. I say clearly, and I really am not just saying this arbitrarily, I love this agency. I really do, I love its mission, I love its people, I love the, uh, the constituents we serve, including you. <laughs> Don't tell your wife I said that. Or even me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, Honestly, this is an incredible time to be in this space. I am so excited. And the employees at the agencies, they're so excited and dedicated to do the right thing, to bridge those divides, to really be the drivers as it relates to innovation, because that's what regulators do. We protect consumers, but we are drivers of innovation and investment. And um, I, again, I'm just... Uh, I'm just, it's just amazing to me that I have a hand in this. Yeah, terrific. I remember when you and I first met and you were uh, on the South Carolina Commission, the communication world was a pretty radically different place 
I mean, in some ways, we understood it. It was sort of mature. There was a sort of set number of players heavily focused on telephone regulation, um, certainly at your level, and, and, and media to a lesser extent at our level. Um, broadband and the internet, I think, have so radically transformed uh, what it is we're focused on as a country from a communication policy. And I wanted to get your perspective uh, on the evolution of broadband, um, both how is the industry doing, honestly? Um, you know, how do you think about uh, the regulator's role in that? Um, even just four years ago when you started the commission, it's sort of been a breathtaking exponential increase uh, in broadband capacity from when you first started. And how, how do you keep pace with that? What's your thoughts about it? How are we doing as a country? From your perspective, from your members' perspective, we've done an incredible job of connecting this nation. Most of America has access to broadband, but our job is not done. We cannot be satisfied with the majority of Americans being, having access, because we know that nearly 100 million Americans do not adopt, adopt broadband at home, and we know that cost is still a factor in some areas. We know that literacy or digital literacy is still a factor in some areas, and we know that the relevance, there are a, a whole host of people who do not see what is in it for them. So we've got some challenges ahead because, you know, when we look at uh, communities, especially those challenged communities, we know that this technology, that broadband, is the great equalizer for a whole host of people. When I go back home to South Carolina, which is relatively a relatively rural state, I see glaring disparities in healthcare, in education, uh, in business opportunities, but I also know that broadband has the potential to be the great equalizer. If you do not have a, a, a foreign language a teacher in your school system, at the click of a mouse, you can transport yourself to an, another country where that language is spoken and you can really uplift uh, the, the, the opportunities for, for those students in areas in my state and the nation where there are no specialists in the area and, and you might be in a crisis. Literally, you sign on and you have a specialist at your disposal. And for those who might be transitioning, you know, who might be in between jobs, who want to augment their income, at the click of a mouse, you can create and connect with individuals all over the world and increase your opportunity uh, for financial gain. This is a phenomenal time. These, this is a phenomenal technology that we'll need, especially in those pockets where it is not robust, would need a government engagement, would need public-private partnerships in order to ensure that, uh, that we receive the full benefit of this incredible, incredible platform. Yeah, we couldn't agree more. We've been working really well with you personally and the Commission on our Connect to Compete efforts and trying to find a way to really get America online and, and enjoy the full blessings of that. Speaking of which, um, just last week we saw that the President of the United States was speaking at a uh, an elementary school and uh, uh, talked about the importance of an initiative to uh, expand broadband capacity to uh, the, the, the elementary school, the schools of the United States, um, something that the cable industry has been doing under the former E-rate program as a leader and are very interested in, in uh, what this new initiative is. What can you tell us about it? Or at least, what, what are your thoughts about the potential possibilities of this new effort? I am very excited that the president called on all of us to take an all of the above approach on this, because he recognizes that it will take industry as well as government and community members all focused on this opportunity to serve our children and our teachers to the best of our abilities. If you look at from where we started, we talked about the investment of in private investment. It has made an incredible difference. Uh, E-rate has made an incredible difference. If you were to look in 1996, 14% of our schools were connected in, in terms of what we described or what we called broadband back then, which is not broadband uh, now. Uh, in about 2005, 94% of the schools were connected, and that was because of E-rate. But if you were to take a poll 
you will find that 80% of the administrators in those very same schools saying they don't have enough speed, they don't have enough capacity, that what we define as broadband is not what they're delivering to those students. So all of the opportunities I mentioned a couple of seconds ago about being able to enhance the educational experience through a robust a video um, platform does not exist for but 20% of our uh, nation's um, children. That is unacceptable, and that is why this initiative is so important, and the FCC will be front and center as it relates to uh, uh, delivering to our teachers and to our children our most precious resource. So just quickly about that, you know, the, the problem with these initiatives often is we know technology is going to change. And I've always thought that if we had the E-rate program to do all over again, we'd do a lot more of it wirelessly as well so that we'd have modularity. The cable industry has been very committed to Wi-Fi uh, as part of its wireless strategy now with 150,000 hotspots up around the country. Do you think there's a place for Wi-Fi in the school initiative as well as just wiring classrooms in the same old way? Absolutely. You and I have both been to Alaska. Uh, we've been to some of the most rural areas um, in in the country, including many parts of my home state. And we have to look at this thing from a business standpoint, meaning everyone is not going to have the, the legacy platforms. It's not economically efficient to literally hardwire this entire country. So that potential um, that you speak is going to work best in some of those communities where it's more expensive to, to serve, where there are more cows and people. Uh, and and so, so we have to take a, an all of the above approach. I mentioned that again, as it relates to service delivery. We have to figure out what's the most efficient way to connect communities. And the approach in which you mentioned uh, with a uh, collaboration with the NTIA, our other federal partners, we're really going to have to you know, work on connecting the most efficient way possible and using both unlicensed and licensed platforms because uh, that uh, has the capacity to, for, to save money. It has the capacity to move uh, traffic you know, from you know, legacy platforms so we can free up and, and, and encourage more speed. So it's a win-win approach when we talk about this and it's got to be, we've got to talk about both licensed and un unlicensed as being a part of the mix. There's no other way we can do it efficiently. Well, it's been so great to have you. We, we, we're very proud to have you here. We have to wrap up. But as my parting question, are you having fun? Yes. <laughs> Parts of most days. <laughs> well, it's been fun to have you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate Chairwoman it. Chairwoman Clyburn. Fantastic.